James Dunlap. I'm actually presenting, I believe I'm presenting. Let me see if it's working or not. Uh, James Dunlap looking at um, my introduction, oral introductions and my PowerPoint slide, looking at uh, slide number one, historical critical method of biblical interpretation and oral presentation by James Dunlap uh, to Dr. Jeff Brickle presented tonight. April the 21st, 2020. Let me get into the introduction. So the definition of the historical, uh, the historical critical method is the effort to discern exactly what happened in, in the history to which the text bears witness, as well as the circumstances and the production of the text. That's quoted from uh, De Silva on page 325. I want to make another quotation from Osborne as the application of background, this quote, application of background data related to a passage in order to determine the authenticity or editorial expression of the text. That's Osborne, page 158. And all of these resources are in the bi bibliography of the actual, um, uh, of the, the, the PowerPoint that I'll be uploading. So historical critical uh, method attempts to elucidate the the text it investigates the text and it attempts to discern the text now let me go into that a little bit more clearly elucidation uh, there are uh, historical persons events institutions and these are also quotes from uh, de silva uh, historical persons events institutions or artifacts that the text mentions that we need to know about in order to understand the text and how much we can learn about the realities of which the text speaks the investigation part of it is the task of of testing the historical accuracy of the passage under investigation how reliable is the data provided by the text about the historical realities it reports are there discrepancies between uh, biblical texts speaking to the same event or phenomenon and do we discover discrepancies when uh, comparing the historical the history reflected in the biblical texts with the history reflected outside of those texts uh, then we have to go through the process of discerning the history of circumstances of the composition and reception of the test of the text. Uh, what can be known about the author, his or her situation, the factors that motivated and shaped the composition of the text. And uh, when we do or go through the process of discerning, it deeply engages the authors of the Old Testament and New Testament introductions in uh, other introductions and commentaries that we might uh, reference or be engaged in. I want to quote something from Barton here, um, and this is in the green uh, text, uh, an introduction, let's see, it's not the introduction to the New Testament, let me find that reference here. But it, uh, in, in the green text, a, the hearing of the New Testament, uh, Barton's article in, in, on the historical criticism says the history of, he, he, he breaks down historical criticism into these, uh, these schools. There's textual criticism, criticism, traditio, uh, historical criticism, and also redaction criticism. Now, these are sub components or sub schools, if you will, of the historical uh, critical method, um, many of which focus on different uh, aspects or different areas, can't go into detail there. Um, but here's the thing that Barton points out is that is that it's dominated the historical criticism a critical method uh, is the dominant primary method of new testament interpretation the historical reason has in large measure <clears throat> and this is a quote from uh, barton again historical reason has in large measure set the terms of validity in, uh, in interpretation for the Bible as a whole. This means that whether or not the application of historical reason to the Bible is the most appropriate way of understanding Scripture, it is essential that it remain an important ingredient in responsible readings of the text. Um, in conclusion, for the description um, of the definition, a part of the canon of New Testament Scripture, and this is a quote from Barton again, page 34 of the Hearing the New Testament. Uh, a book uh, by Joel B. Green, edited by Joel B. Green. 
And as part of the canon of Scripture, the New Testament is read above all by members of the various Christian faith communities as a, counterintu or as a counterintuitive part of their worship and discipline. Because the Bible, this is a point that I thought was, was very poignant, the Bible is the book of the church. And as such, it is read with the primary goal, not of discovering historical data, but of growth in the knowledge and the love of God. So going into the historical development of the method, we can see here playing the slideshow on slide three, um, the historical critical method was present in antiquity. Interesting note, the New Testament itself uses the historical method. Now it might not go into the, the discipline of historical, historical criticism, but it does use the historical method. The patriarchs uh, immediately following the writing of the New Testament used a history to support uh, their proofs. So it's, it's present in, in the medieval. Uh, let me correct that real quick. It's present in medieval times. It's present in the uh, Renaissance. It really began to take hold and, and promote itself or be, be promoted by Enlightenment pioneers. Then obviously in the 20th century, it's, it's present throughout. Now having said that, um, historical criticism, and this is again a quote from Barton, and its modes have dominated the primary method of New Testament interpretation in the 20th century. I wanna go swiftly to an application in the, uh, in the New Testament text. Okay, give me one second here. So in John chapter one and verse one, how, how can we use historical criticism uh, to uh, support our, our effort. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Um, uh, Milne in, uh, 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 says this, John uses a special category. So here in, in, some, of the co uh, in some of the commentaries that we read, um, and this is the message of John, B. Milne makes this statement, um, he uses John. He's saying John uses a special category, Jesus Christ, the Word of God. So he's actually appealing to philosophical categories, and he goes on and says that um, scholars have found a uh, quote. Uh, scholars have found it particularly fruitful theme for investigation to establish poss possible sources of the Logos concept and decide which one was especially determined for this gospel. Uh, Hermeneia commentary says this, quote, Philo has taken, uh, has therefore written, the logos means only theos and, and not otheos or hotheos, so God, it means divine. So anyway, uh, the point being here is that many commentators and commentaries um, use John's reference to the logos to suggest that he's appealing to Greek philosophy. It, it does at least um, include the examination of the range of possible meanings of the logos, and, and the impetus there, I think, uh, the thrust is to uh, is that John is appealing to Greek philosophy, and that's why he uses the term logos. Now, using the historical critical method, we see that the date of the writing of John, we have to investigate this. There's actually some, some contrast there. There's many scholars that believe it was written in the late first century. Some actually believe it was written possibly in Judea or around that time before 70 AD. And so here we're going we're gonna to draw a contrast to understand that that the date of the writing of John might play into how we understand John meaning uh, John's appeal to the Logos doctrine. So if it was a late writing and he was out in Gentile lands. He probably would uh, possibly, or the, the writer of, of John or whoever it was that authored uh, the gospel possibly was appealing to Gentile concepts to appeal to Gentiles. If it was an early date and, and it was before the fall uh, of Jerusalem, it was before 70 AD, then what we see is that the concept of the Logos um, is probably channeling, if you will, or alluding to understanding uh, uh, the, the, uh, the concepts and principles of Judean Jews and not of Greek philosophy. And so because of that, uh, we actually can, can make some doctrinal uh, assertions on, on John 1.1 1, 1 based on that conclusion or evaluation of the a historical uh, critical method. So I want to go on to pros and cons. Let me go here. Logos, philosophical category, Jewish principle, how the date of writing. So I just discovered, I just reviewed that. So pros and cons. So the pros of the historical 
um, the historical critical method is it appeals to reason, to the mind of man. It also appeals to logic and rationale. Cons is it's used by critics and skeptics to uh, reduce faith. So there's apparent contradictions, and I can't get into all of it, but there's possible contradictions, and critics and skeptics will use the historical critical method to go and point out these contradictions and show us why we cannot have faith in the Word of God. And this is a problem, I think, with the historical critical method. It opens itself up, lends itself up to um, uh, the utilization by critics of Christian faith. So I want to go to my first uh, reflection and wrap up here. Um, let me go back. It's not a false dichotomy. I want to say this. A reflection on the value, uh, the value here is the tension between faith and skepticism. Um, his, the historical critical method inhabits that tension between faith and skepticism. We consider the observation, now th these are my thoughts, of apparent contradiction between te texts or even the contradiction uh, of the text and the known history. And so De Silva uses the story of the cleansing of the temple, the dilemma there. John has the cleansing of the temple in the first of, of his gospel, and Matthew and Mark and the synoptic gospels have it towards the end. And so trying to reconcile this, the probability is not there. So skeptics will use that to say, well, you can't have faith in the in, in confidence in the word of God. Um, but we, we can go on and say that, yes, we can. Um, because what does it mean, the when we stand on and say the infallible word of God, what do I mean by that? Here's something I want to point out. When we think of infallibility, maybe we're not thinking so much about the actual organization and order of the words in the text. Maybe we're talking more about the infallibility of the ideal that we're aspiring to, the principles that are being conveyed in the scripture. And does that mean that we dismiss the text? No, it doesn't mean that we dismiss the text. What it means is that we embrace the text because the text, in, in spite of all its nuances and possible contradictions, is what gave us the instructions and principles uh, that we can that we can live by. So using it's not a false dichotomy. It's not uh, either or. It's not either the text is without flaw or discrepancy. Your faith is futile um, versus every word, every order, every letter and story is exactly perfect. And thus the the my life is is a, a, a effort in apologetics to uh, dedicated to defending the integrity of the order and organization of the of the scripture so the point there being is that it's it's not a dichotomy it's not either you can have full faith and everything has to be exactly true or, or it's it's false um so the the truth actually lies somewhere in between the second reflection here i'm going to conclude is that all the methods of study that we're learning uh, are valuable in understanding the truth, understanding the will of God, investigating the innumerable nuances. And so it's not just historical critical method. It's not just uh, word study. It's not just any of these, uh, uh, the, the nuances of genre or the, the structure of, of, the, of the text. It's, it's all of these together. It gives us a, 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 a width of, of oceans, a depths that we can plumb. Um, we'll never get to the end of it. As John said, the world cannot contain the books that should be written. Then we read in John 20 and verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so that is my presentation. Thank you. Let me stop this.